18 months ago. Back then I said, David tells our story, the liberal story that created modern Australia, warts and all. Well, the third volume moves into that very space. The early years of the Commonwealth brought into being by those who shared liberal aspirations and values across the new nation, from urban and rural areas with different cultural and economic backgrounds and experiences, and all the different perspectives and sometimes clashes that these bring. Of course, the great political clash amongst liberals of the era was the battle over free trade. And in this battle, Victoria has a special place. But unlike in the first volume, with Victoria post Eureka being a uniquely positive force for liberalism, Victoria, Victorian liberalism in this era is overshadowed by the power and consequences of protectionism. The rise of the labor movement, especially the utopian sectional and authoritarian element that David describes in such detail, meant that the politics of protection became too hard to beat in the short term. Victorian protectionism created a status quo that even ardent free traders realised could not be unwound in the new Commonwealth. Too many were dependent on patronage and favouritism, despite these elements increasingly poisoning politics. Victory for a domestic free market inside the new Commonwealth was hard won, but an international one became increasingly insurmountable. And not just because of domestic politics. In a lesson Australia has repeatedly learned, a trading nation is also subject to the world it lives in. And then, as arguably now, storm clouds are gathering against free trade. I found David's outline of how little interest in the tariff bills Deakin seemed to show in the contests in the early Commonwealth Parliament particularly interesting. For a man so identified with protection, he wasn't at its thrusting core as it was legislated. Is this partly explained by his conversion to protection by Syme? Or was it a compromise the man made to deliver his other priorities? If so, he wouldn't be the first politician to do so, but David's more eminently qualified than anyone else to answer that question. One of the particular gems of this book I found is its outline of Joseph Cook. Even amongst the relatively poor knowledge of the political history of our early years, Joseph Cook seems relatively forgotten. I note he's also the only former prime minister not to have an electorate named after him. The current seat of Cook occupied by the prime minister being named after Lieutenant, Lieutenant James, who cited this land from the endeavor 250 years ago. Joseph Cook seemed to me to encapsulate some of the challenges of the liberals of the era. Uncomfortable with what we might now describe as race baiting undertaken by other leaders, notably the Labor Party. An instinctive free trader, but conscious of the power of vested interests that entrench protectionism, and particularly motivated by the offensiveness of preferences and discriminations among citizens that the Labor movement and its political representatives demanded. Upon winning the narrowest of elections, he faced a Senate as hostile as any Commonwealth government has ever faced, with Labor's explicit objective crippling the government. Given it was only a handful of years earlier that the Commons had faced down the Lords in the United Kingdom and broken its power over financial matters, Cook's liberal streak is illustrated by comparing Hughes and Labor to Tory oligarchs, as Labor made explicit that the Senate would be used to obstruct. This is another reminder that no one likes losing power, particularly those representing sectional interests. And also a reminder that late, later Labor claims of Senate obstructionism are utterly opportunistic. While I find that portrait of Cook fascinating as I can't claim to know him well, and I think his battles encapsulate many of the liberal challenges of the era, I find the Hughes portrait more challenging. I come at Hughes as a visceral opponent of conscription and conscious that his campaigns around that issue created social scars along religious lines that lingered for decades. And I don't have time to go into this man's extraordinary career here, but as any, anyone with an understanding of Australian political history will have an opinion on Hughes, this book is particularly well worth reading, as no matter one's initial opinion, it will be challenged and you will need to rethink it. This volume will also bring the politically informed a real sense of deja vu, as it outlines how many of the seemingly eternal contests of Australian politics were set in our early years. Marxist utopianism may have declined in influence, but state-driven utopianism without the overtly authoritarian streak remains in those who seek a perfect world created by politicians or, at least as often, experts. In the early years, it was the proposal for independent experts to assign protection levels. Now we see it in proposals for a reserve bank-like climate authority to determine national policy where political contests don't result in a desired answer. The early years of the Commonwealth also illustrated the foundational role of the pledge and binding caucus and the external control of one side of politics, seeing elected members as delegates of a sectional interest as opposed to representatives of the people and their common interests. 
it not only forced out founding members of the labor movement, but it is inevitable that when one side of politics adopts these measures, it impacts how the contest of politics itself is conducted, as well as its primary competitor. This malign influence continues to exist today, where in my view, the binding caucus unnecessarily limits and constrains the parliament. And finally, the evolving Labor Party into an authoritarian and hostile force within the new democracy saw the artificial conflation of the union movement with the broader group of workers. In the words of Hughes' biographer that David uses, the new Labor Party was to be the party of trades hall and union official, not the shearing shed and shop floor. It's difficult to think off the top of my head of a single identifiable issue in Australian politics that has argued and been debated as constantly as this has. Given the circumstances of this afternoon's event, one cannot help try, but try to draw lessons from the challenges David outlines to those we face now and will undoubtedly do in the foreseeable future. In the activities of the state, inertia matters. This is but one illustration of the battles liberal, liberals faced in the era covered by this book. Following the 1890s depression, the rise of militant unionism and the purging of liberal voices from within the labor movement, and then the social and human catastrophe of the First World War, there were clamors for state action that threatened the new liberal democratic state. Emergency measures, such as those introduced during wartime, can create a new status quo for peacetime as well, not just in granting officials powers, but also in expectations of the people, of groups within the community, and the degree of state control that will be tolerated. Protection and preferment create political constituencies for temporary measures to become more permanent. Today, with an international crisis, we're living through an era of unprecedented state activity as well, completely unforeseen in both economic terms, as well as laws governing personal and private behaviour, only a matter of months ago. So at some point, liberals will need to turn our minds to what next? Knowing that some may seek, like some may seek to maintain a larger state role after the immediate crisis passes. In conclusion, while a reader of this volume would definitely benefit from commencing with land of dreams and a free country, it can also be read by those with a specific interest in the early years of that federation. As a source of material and reference to other figures and collections, it is more comprehensive than anything I have come across. And it now gives me great pleasure to introduce my, my friend, um, David Kemp. Um, I'd like to commence with a short thank you as to be mentioned by David in his acknowledgements is quite an honor. David's extraordinary contribution to Australian liberalism covers every possible field, from education to the Liberal Party as its vehicle, to serving in high public office, as well as being a friend and mentor to many of us who have followed. However, this extraordinary work will outlast all of us, and it is a pleasure to both congratulate him and to introduce him today as we launch this third volume. Congratulations, David. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, that's a uh, wonderful you, David. launch of the book and a wonderful introduction. Can you hear me? Yep. 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 Uh, it's, uh, it's been a great pleasure to, um, to know you over the years and today to welcome you to the study where all these books are written. Um, <laughs> some of the references that I've used are actually behind me and they appear in footnotes in the book. So um, this is quite a good place for me at least to launch the book. Uh, you've given a, a wonderful account, I think, of the politics of the period. Um, and perhaps I could just say a few words about what these books are about and, and, and why, why I've written them. Uh, I suppose I've been inspired by the comments of people like uh, Robert Menzies particularly, and repeat, <coughs> excuse me, repeated by John Howard, that politics is really a battle of ideas. And if it is a battle of ideas, the question always arises, well, what are those ideas and which ones influence politics and how do they do so? So although it's a book about ideas, it's not a book of political philosophy. It's a book about, as you so clearly outline, about political life. And so the ideas that are relevant to politics are the ideas as they're articulated by individual people, by Deacon and protectionism and by Reed and free trade or by Hughes and an extreme version of nationalism. Uh, you've got a, a, also behind those people, there are organisations. And those organisations embody those ideas in their platforms uh, and in the purposes that they try to sell to the electorate. Uh, and behind the organisations and arising out of the ideas, you've got the policies of governments working through institutions which embody ideas and how they, those ideas work out in practice 
depends on the people, the quality and logic of the ideas themselves, and the circumstances in which they're implemented. So that sounds quite a complicated picture, but it's actually the, the scene that I've tried to write down in these books to, to make the ideas at the heart of politics live through the people and the organisations and the policies and to explain the way in which they intersect with the events that Australia has come through, the development of a new country on a new continent uh, for the European settlers after 1788, uh, through the First World War, through grappling with the consequences of that war, through, and I've taken this particular story through to 1925. So, let me just say that by way of introduction that I think that period falls into three main um, elements. One is the pre-1914 period. And the pre-1914 period is what I would describe as the period of the dominance of liberal ideas. Uh, liberal ideas had led to the formation of Australia as a nation. They'd written its constitution. They inform the structure of its institutions to protect individual freedom uh, through the constitution that the Liberals had written. Uh, Australia itself and its constitution was the great Liberal triumph. And it was through that constitution then that the Liberals debated and disagreed with each other often, as over free trade and protectionism, to try to develop what they saw as being the preferred course for the nation into the future. So that's the first period. Liberals aiming at the harmonious, free, liberal society, but struggling with each other about how to do that. And that's the battle encapsulated in the relationship, the difficult relationship between Deacon, Reed and Cook. Then the First World War strikes. And the First World War of course, not only inflates the role of government enormously, we get income tax introduced, we get a whole variety of new taxes introduced, we get a level of regulation of Australian industry that took decades to roll back. And as you said quite correctly in your uh, launch remarks, uh, every privilege and every uh, opportunity that, nation, that industries get out of regulation, they want to hold on to. And, and so every regulation creates its interests to defend it. And so what I do is to look at how Australian democracy channels those interests and how those interests gain power and influence and how they try to use the institutions of Australian democracy to pursue their own special interests rather than necessarily the public interest as a whole. And what you do find through this period is a loss of direction by the Liberals. Uh, and that, of course, is organisationally expressed in the uh, end of Deakin's Liberal Party when it merges with Hughes National Labor to form a Win the War Party uh, in 1916. And, and the founding Labor leaders, as you mentioned, are expelled from the Labor Party. And then you've got the post-war period in which people like Bruce in particular, after Hughes is um, dismissed from the Prime Ministership, um, uh, try to untangle this and try to get the nation back on an enterprising path and try to stimulate economic growth and struggle enormously to do this against the tremendous power that the union movement has acquired by that time. And it would probably have worked all right had it not been for the coming uh, into Australia through that period, the Marxist socialists, uh, the Bellamy so Bellamyites, the utopian socialists who really didn't want a liberal Australia at all, but wanted an Australia uh, organised with uh, administered markets, no prices and no price system, and everybody on equal incomes, a sort of extreme form of collectivism, which was exaggerated in Australia by the Russian Revolution and its consequences here which led to the Communist Party being formed in 1920 uh, and the adoption by the Labor Party of the Socialist Objective in 1921. And that fed into a tremendous amount of industrial strife during the 1920s, uh, which made it incredibly difficult for Bruce and the Liberals behind him to get the economy moving again. 
So as the First Depression, uh, Great Depression came after 1925, uh, Australia basically was in the position of what we saw with Greece a few years ago during the global financial crisis. It was uh, incredibly heavily in debt, 125% of GDP was the size of its national debt. Countries wouldn't live with it. There needed to be a rollback to a freer country. And what we see in this first volume is the emergence, and I'll finish on this, the emergence of Robert Menzies from a very liberal family who realised that Australia had to move back to its more fundamental liberal principles of freedom of enterprise and individual freedom. And we, we first meet him in this volume, but the fourth volume will be essentially a volume around the way in which Menzies rescued Australia from what was um, a country that had become very overregulated and, and very muddled in its directions. In fact, by 1929, Australia probably had the largest government and the most intrusive government measured in terms of spending uh, and regulation like protection, uh, tax levels, government enterprises of any Western country. So there was a huge job to be done. And uh, this volume really sets out the remarkable story, how we got into that position, how Australian democracy um, became uh, the vehicle by which special interests, as you say, uh, invented this enormous government, which then had to be rolled back. Yeah, so I'll, you, I'll leave it there, Nick, and we can have a chat. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank, th th thank you, Scott, that, for those two great introductions to this book, uh, A Democratic Nation, A Democratic Nation by David Kemp, Volume 3. Of, although, you know, as I see, you don't put numbers on the side, David, but it is Volume 3 of your... It is uh, Volume 3. Five, five, is that on the inside cover? <laughs> five volumes, I think, the last time I checked. It was talk of a six, but I, I don't know. But anyway, look, thank you so much for that. And look, I, let me just say before we move on to the... I feel today uh, I had a very strong sense of why this book is important, a series of important, uh, in this extraordinary period in our history when um, we faced so many difficult decisions but a bit, uh, with the coronavirus and this, uh, a big task too, of course, in ensuring that the economy can then ride its way to this. But to do so impinge on those humble you're dropping out a bit, Nick. Anyway, I'll keep going. I'll keep going. Um, it's good. We'll get these links better as we go along. But look, um, I just also say, if you haven't noticed, you can you can call up on the. Uh, Can't hear you at all now. Yeah, James, I think we've lost uh, Nick. I might just um, jump in. Uh, we're having some questions come through from our panelists on the line. We're now over a hundred. And um, one of our panelists has asked, David, if you can share some thoughts on the liberal fight for our freedoms as individuals and the house arrest going on in Australia and particularly in New South Wales today. Well, I particularly don't want to get into a discussion of current political events. Um, interesting as that question is, indeed, I think about it every day, and I, uh, particularly when I, I, I read the stories. And, and we're obviously in a situation where uh, there are very great, in fact, quite unprecedented uh, restrictions on individual liberty in Australia today, uh, as there were during the First World War. Uh, today, they're even greater. Uh, the great challenge for Liberals in Australia is going to be to make sure that we return as soon as possible to the freedoms with which we'd become accustomed before this pandemic broke out. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, it was really the coming of Robert Menzies that helped Australia finally roll back the restrictions of the First World War uh, that were supported by the powerful economic interests. Um, and uh, during the Second World War, he outlined that in The Forgotten People, how he was going to do that and then did it. So I, I think the main lesson that comes out of this is that all those involved in government today, and particularly, of course, the Liberals, uh, need to be very aware of when the turning point comes 
and, and, and when those freedoms can begin to be restored. Yeah, I think, I, I hope you've got me now. I dropped out there. There's things going to happen, obviously, from time to time. Look, uh, I was just explaining, there is a, a comment panel on the right, James, uh, just, just read out from that. So please send your comments in. It's great to see people, uh, great friends of ours, so we can see their names coming up. Uh, look, um, uh, and, and Scott, you please feel free to contribute to this conversation as well. Um, what, what uh, we might turn now to World War One because I think there is um, some similarity. You know, you're dealing with a, a, an enemy, you're dealing with the fog of war. I like to think we're in, in a sort of fog of coronas at the moment. It's hard to make policies, it's hard to get the information you need, and there's an element of risk in everything you do. Uh, talk me through the consequences of that when the state suddenly ramps up for it to deal with an emergency um, how, how quickly does it wind down and who's involved in that mm. there are two very interesting consequences of the first world war um, uh, at the level of ideas uh, one consequence was that uh, obviously the restrictions of war, the mobilization of a, a nation that had been a long way from wars, it hadn't been uninvolved, but it, not many had been involved in the wars of the, the empires before that. But during the First World War, uh, people on both sides of politics, and there were liberals within the Labor Party as well, I tend to think of them as the liberal socialists. They, they believed in a big role for government, but they also believed in liberal political institutions and, and civil liberties. They had to work out what their attitude was to conscription. And, and people um, uh, on both sides of politics in Australia, the Liberals with a capital L and uh, the more liberal of the Labor leaders um, after Fisher, who opposed conscription, but the later Lib Labor leaders, uh, Hughes and um, uh, his supporters, uh, believed that a democratic nation in the end had to go to conscription because otherwise you had a potentially a very significant number of people who free rode on the efforts of others and the willingness of others to sacrifice their lives to save the liberal democratic institutions of Australia. So that's how they came to conscription as liberals. The other thing that happened was that the those who rejected the liberal economy and liberal economic freedoms, the socialists and the more extreme collectivist socialists, what I call the utopian socialists, became more and more extreme during the First World War. And there were, in fact, people who regarded themselves as revolutionaries, and uh, Hughes cracked down on those and introduced uh, what was regarded then and probably now as a very draconian uh, War Precautions Act. Um, there were revolutionary actions. There was fire bombing of buildings in Sydney. Uh, some people were actually executed for murders in the course of this revolutionary activity. Um, so we were a nation very torn apart during that period. And that made it, I think, exceptionally difficult in the post-war period to come together to roll back the special interest arrangements that had been put in place during the war to fight the war and coordinate the war effort. Um, and that's something one always must be, be very wary of, that in the end, Australia will come together after this crisis, as it did after the Second World War under Menzies' leadership, uh, if we can keep harmony in the community, as the Prime Minister emphasises, and, and, and people seeing that we're engaged in a common cause rather than coming apart because we're engaged in separate courses. And the most likely sort of division is going to be over the protection of liberties versus central coordination. And uh, we're going to find people of all different political stripes involved in those debates. And it's important that our political system be responsive to them. Thank you, David. I might just uh, jump in there. Nick's having further problems with his audio. Um, we talk about, you spoke about this time in Australia's history where uh, essentially the government was becoming larger and larger on, on steroids even, and um, therefore that led to a lot of regulation. And during this period, essentially, we had the Labor Party and everybody who wasn't the Labor Party. What, what, were, their str what were the big issues that they were struggling with at that time? And what, were, what was the commonality of 
the issues for the non-Labor um, parties in Australian politics during the period? Yeah. Well, first of all, there was the, the Liberal agenda. Let's go back to the, the point of Federation. Uh, the Liberal project was in good health at Federation, despite the fact that the Victorian and New South Wales Liberals were politically at each other's throats over protectionism versus free trade. But they were proud of the constitution that they'd written. They were proud of the Liberal institutions and the protections of individual liberty they'd put in place. Uh, within a couple of years, Australia gave votes for women and uh, also the right of women to enter Parliament Several, two decades before Britain and the United States were in the same position. I mean, the whole history we hear about suffragettes, for example, is a history of what happened in other countries. Uh, suffragettes in Australia had been 1880s and 1890s, and they'd won by 1902. Uh, so that was an example to the rest of the world. Uh, the Liberals were particularly um, concerned about building national infrastructure. Uh, Cam the site of Canberra was identified. Uh, they were keen on advancing education. They had universal primary education in place from the 1870s. They, secondary education uh, in government schools began to be organised in the first decade after Federation. I think perhaps looking back on it now with hindsight, the greatest achievement of Australian democracy was built, bringing the working class into politics. So that by the time we got to Federation, Australia wasn't run by the upper or upper middle classes uh, as American politics tended to be or British politics tended to be. We had really um, two parallel elites, if you like. We had a, a working class elite, well, well educated in prim with primary education, but with full political access. Um, and the voices of many uh, of those in the, the working class were the Liberal parties. And that was particularly so in Victoria, which had had a uh, very strong base in the working class from the 1870s. And it was true also to a large extent in New South Wales. And so the reason the Labor Party was a bit slow to get off the ground, because it was founded in 1890, and at Federation in the first elections, votes in, in the states where the Liberals were well established were quite low. And it wasn't until 1910 that you had the first elected Labor government. That was again decades before um, what happened in Britain. The first elected Labor government in Britain was in, in after the first, Second World War. So that shows just how far ahead of the game Australian democracy was. Um, but there were a number of other issues that were really very much on the agenda and they came out of identity politics. People were concerned about Australian nationalism, which really was at the root of protectionism. Uh, they were concerned about white Australia. Uh, there was a rise of racist sentiment and, and a growing consciousness of race. Uh, they were concerned about um, compulsory arbitration and the prevention of working class politics becoming class-based identity politics, and that's why we ended up with the arbitration system. During the Second World War, interestingly, um, the Liberals became increasingly concerned at the capacity of the unions to get out the votes. And that's the real reason that I show in this book why we ended up with compulsory voting, because that was introduced by the Liberals. And it was introduced because they thought their organisations would not be strong enough to get out the vote to combat the socialists in the Labor Party. And it was to prevent Australia going the full hog towards socialism that the Liberals introduced <coughs> compulsory voting. It was first done in Queensland in 1915 and then um, in 1924 at the federal level and all the states followed shortly thereafter. Um, so that showed both the strength of Australia um, as a country which had incorporated the whole society in its political system uh, but also, and the desire to make Australian democracy work. Uh, but it also showed, I think, the, the challenge of keeping liberal principles in the forefront of people's minds uh, during this uh, post-war period of big government. Scott, you and I were talking about earlier when we were discussing the themes in this book about the important debate, the big debate of that time, 
protectionism versus free trade. Uh, could you give me some insights into that and then perhaps David can follow up? Well, the lesson I took away from the description of that in this book was we forget that the battle for free trade within Australia itself was not an easy one. That had been settled. Uh, that had been settled uh, constitutionally with the new federation. Um, however, the Braddon Clause, which was soon neutered by the Commonwealth Parliament, but effectively said that the great proportion of tariff revenues would be returned to the states in order to protect their budgetary situations, actually effectively established an inertia towards there being a tariff. And the debate then became not about whether Australia would be free trade, but whether or not it was actually going to be a revenue tariff, i.e. just enough to fund the government, or a protectionist tariff. The second element was that because of the way the Victorian protectionist regime had evolved, um, you saw from people like Joseph Cook and the old free traders that there was sort of a, not a surrender, but an acceptance of the fact that it was not politically feasible with the size of Victoria in the national economy and as part of the, national, uh, the, the new Commonwealth to wind all that back. Uh, it just, the numbers were not going to be there for it particularly because of the alliance um, with a lot of the labour movement with the support for protection. As David points out, there were free trade voices within the labour movement, uh, but the stronger voices added to the fact that there are people that made a lot of money out of it, add that to the fact that there were those who, for all the right reasons, you know, thought this was a better way to uh, end sweating and have fairer workplaces, for the same reasons they support things like arbitration. Uh, it just meant that because it was there, it was a very, very difficult project to unwind. Uh, and added to the factors that David's just outlined, um, particularly post-World War I, sexual interests um, are harder to take on when you have a society that views itself as divided. Uh, we call it now identity politics. It was called other things, whether it be religion or class politics uh, a century ago. But sectional interests um, find that sort of political environment easier to protect the privilege than when there are strong appeals and an overwhelming community urge towards the common interest. Um, and you can understand why the scars on world war um, and just how devastating it was for a young nation, um, as well as all the controls David talked about, you can understand why it had that impact. David? I think perhaps what I'll add to what Scott said is um, why I think the ideas in Australia at the time uh, made it easier for protectionism to win that first round. Um, Australia was essentially without economists. Now, those who follow economic debates in the press will say, oh, well, that was a good thing, but it wasn't a good thing because uh, economists were the main carriers of the ideas of Adam Smith, who was probably the strongest believer and, and strongest theorist about why a free society worked. And, and why a free economy worked. Uh, and, and in Britain, where political economy or economics, as it was from the 1890s called, uh, was strong, uh, remained essentially free trade, although there were protectionists in the Liberal Party like Joseph Chamberlain. Um, free trade remained through until the 1930s. There were advocates for protection, but, but free trade survived. But in Australia, in the absence of any departments of economics and very few people arguing the economic case, the case for free trade fell into the hands of special people who are special interests and the few like Reid who were aware of the economic arguments. And in Australia, the case for free trade came to be seen very much as a special interest case by importing and exporting businesses. Uh, those who are engaged in uh, international politics and international trade. And the argument as to why it was actually good for the working class, although Reid tried to make that, and Cook, Cook fervently believed that, uh, was not strongly made by any third voices. So the political case was weakly put, whereas the anti-free trade case was put at the level of ideas by people like David Syme, who wrote a whole series of articles in the age, but also a book that was internationally widely read by protectionists, working with protectionists in Britain, uh, who sought to refute Adam Smith and, and, and all the, the core 
writers of economists and, and people like Deacon, who was a lawyer, had no way of, of knowing who was right and who was wrong on this matter. So because of a, an intellectual gap, as it were, in Australia, we plunged into protectionism. And as Scott quite rightly says and appropriately says, uh, once the constitution was written and the main revenues came from customs duties levied on imported goods, uh, it was very, very difficult to make the case for free trade. And uh, Cook was the last leader essentially who tried to make it, though it's rather pathetic in a way to watch Stanley Melbourne Bruce struggling in the 1920s to make the obvious point that if Australia is going to grow its economy, it's going to need international markets. And if we're going to have to have international markets, then we've got to allow other countries to use our markets. There's got to be an element of reciprocity in it. He didn't make that case very successfully before the Great Depression struck, but he was in that position because there wasn't any sensible economic analysis before that. And he, he tried to establish some economic advisory groups because the economic profession was just getting going by the 1920s. The Economic Record, its main journal, uh, was first published in 1925. You're on mute, Nick. Still can't hear you, Nick. Nick's on mute. Yeah, you're on mute, Nick. Okay, am I back? Yeah. <laughs> Technology. So David's book, A Democratic Nation, uh, is uh, we're launching today. Uh, and, and since we're putting you to some inconvenience, you can't get the book signed by the author, as we normally expect on occasions like this. Uh, we, we're going to arrange, if you don't mind, David, we'll bring, uh, we'll bring a, bo a box down to you and get you to sign them. Uh, for people who buy the book. So anybody, uh, you can go online uh, after this right away. I'll get James to come on and uh, at the end and tell you exactly how to do that. And uh, uh, and what's more, I think if you if you mark on, uh, you know what 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 uh, inscription you'd like on there, uh, I'm sure David might be happy to oblige. So and we'll do, we'll do that post free for this time. Sixty dollars uh, post free, and the, the same goes for the two previous books in the series. Uh, we're banking on the fact that a lot of people are going to have a little bit more time to stay at home and read, uh, which would be a good thing. Well, I think we, 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 we'll soon be um, wrapping up, I think. But uh, uh, David, uh, interesting at this period, your book ends in uh, 1925. Uh, in December 1925, uh, a, a smart young lawyer from Melbourne uh, celebrates his 29th birthday, I think, if I've done my maths right. Uh, no, 31st, 31st birthday. And, uh, and uh, he's, he's a man we're going to hear a lot more of in the next volume. Who's that? Well, Robert Menzies uh, was just uh, beginning his um, interest in politics, I think his active interest, um, around the time this book finishes. He was a highly successful young lawyer. He'd been um, president of the Students' Representative Council at Melbourne University. He'd written an article during the war uh, on the rule of law during wartime. Uh, so he was concerned about liberal issues then. He came from a liberal family. Uh, his father had been a member of parliament, uh, a supporter of uh, Deakin. Uh, his father-in-law, as it turned out, uh, Leckie, Jack Leckie, uh, was also um, a member of parliament and later indeed a member of Menzies Ministry uh, during the Second World War. Um, and uh, his family was politically exceedingly interested. And they obviously talked about the implication of the merger of Deakin's Liberal Party with Hughes's National Labor Party. And uh, they came to the view that liberalism needed to be revived and liberal ideas needed a voice. And that voice was an organisation. And there were two Liberal Parties, new Liberal Parties established during the 1920s, one of them during the time of this book. And Menzies himself began to articulate these views and to express very great dissatisfaction with compulsory arbitration and with the increasing role of communists in the as officials in the trade union movement and he worked with uh, Owen Dixon to have the, um, the Siemens Union deregistered uh, during the industrial disputes of the 1920s. So Menzies was just gathering his strength I think and, and his intellectual arguments to make the case for liberalism in Australia and returning to a more liberal society by the time this book ends. And in 1928, uh, several years later, he comes into the Victorian Parliament 
and, and becomes then quite a significant voice interstate. Uh, and in 1934, takes the seat of Kuyong and enters the federal parliament. So while utopian socialism is on the rise, we see liberalism making a comeback. <laughs> I, I hope that's what we're going to see now. I, I, I just feel there's a desperate uh, need now for us to restate clearly the principles of liberalism as we make some very hard decisions, uh, not only now, but coming out of this period. Uh, Scott, I'm not going to ask you to name names, but uh, do we have the thought leaders? Do we have the people with that sound grasp uh, these days who can help steer us, uh, you know, on that, that path out of this? Well, I think the lesson of this book is that um, I think one of the chapters is liberalism under threat, uh, which was one of the ones I, I found particularly interesting is um, the liberal movement in Australia has always been strong enough, even in um, troubling times, like the times David writes about in this book, to, to find a champion. Because what I've picked up is that these values are innate from so many people who are politically engaged. Um, they're, they're innate in the institutions that people are brought up with, um, the, the, the sort of social codes that we live with. So in that sense, I'm an optimist. I mean, Australian liberalism has always had a, a more utilitarian streak than the limited government liberalism that the United States has. And so because we have that strongly utilitarian streak, we have always seen, for example, during wartime, the acceptance of a much larger state. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of conscription, but um, I can see the rationale for it. Um, and so that greatest good for the greatest number, um, as well as that, that, that John Stuart Mill principle of um, essentially, are you harming others, which David also refers to in numerous parts in this book, they underpin our liberalism. There'll always be debates amongst liberals about the extent of the state because people answer that question differently. I said earlier that I think we are in a period of, un of unprecedented activity. If I described the situation in Australia or globally now to anyone three months ago, they wouldn't believe me. So I, for example, think they are entirely consistent with the values that, uh, the, and the, that liberals have used in times of national emergency over the last century, even though they're not something that I've ever personally experienced before. The test now is the same test that I think David comes to at the end of this volume, which is um, we don't necessarily have all the architecture of sexual interests holding this in place as they did in place in Australia over decades. We will have economic trauma. Um, we hope to avoid as much health trauma as we can through the measures we're adopting. But there's always in the ebbs and flows of, of political debate times when ideas come under challenge or they're at their peak. And, Liberalism had a very good period in Australia, free markets, civil liberties, um, reducing um, barriers on people's personal behaviour, things like that. Um, now the test for liberals is how do we deal with changing situations with values that are consistent? But I remember David once told me a long time ago, it was at a, a, a Deacon lecture about 25 years ago, David, uh, when in my youth I, was, I, I didn't I wasn't necessarily a fan of Deacon because of his protectionist and white Australia stance. Um, but Liberal values can lead to different policy responses depending on the situation the country finds itself in. This is a unique situation. And so I find what we're doing now entirely consistent with liberal values. The challenge is how do you go back to a liberal society absent the crisis? And that particularly I found um, apt reading this book about the recovery from volume one at this very time. Oh, sorry, the recovery from World War One at this very time. Perhaps I can answer that, Nick. Please do. Uh, I think, first of all, um, if you look where liberal ideas come from over the years, there is always an identifiable centre of liberal thought. Um, and there are think tanks in Australia back in the 1880s uh, advocating liberal ideas and, and with contact internationally with similar think tanks in America um, and groups in Britain. Uh, and, and you find that... Um, uh, again, from the Second World War on, Australia has sort of become quite heavily populated by think tanks of all kinds, but, but certainly liberal think tanks. Uh, so you, you certainly need the thought leaders, as you said, and, and, and I agree with what Scott said. But the other point that I think we haven't made so far, and that I, I firmly believe is true for Australia, is that Australia is culturally a much more liberal nation than most countries. That if someone articulates the liberal case, it will receive an echo in Australia from the Australian electorate. And, and the fundamental reason for that, I think, and for that culture 
is that modern Australia is an immigrant country and all people anywhere in the world want to control their own lives. That's, that's the fundamental liberal interest. It's the interest of every individual person is to be themselves and to be able to express themselves, whether they're in China or Europe or America or Australia. This, this, this is the nature of humanity. It's human nature. But you need a culture which is favourable to that. And in Australia, because we're an immigrant nation, we have a culture in which people want to control their own lives. That's why they've come here. Uh, that's part of the family's ethos, is to build up the family's capacity to live the kind of life that it wants. And, and that, that desire to live your own life is a very, very powerful idea in Australia. Mm. Ideas of subordination and going along with the ruling class or going along with the party or, you know, just going along is not part of the Australian ethos. And so, like Scott, I'm, I'm really quite optimistic. I think once this um, pandemic is passed, there will be a very strong support for the ideas of, that will support the policies of returning to a liberal and free Australia. Yeah. Australians have become very used to since the 1960s. You're on mute still, Nick. You're, 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 you're on mute? I'm back now. Yeah. Uh, and if this drops out, James, you pick up on the, the comments from people, but it's great to see so many people sending in comments and, and some questions. There's a question from Victor Purton, which I, I think you've just answered, David. He asks, uh, what makes you optimistic for Australians getting through the pandemic and leaving globally into the recovery? I mean, I, I believe we're very well placed to do that. And uh, the most important thing, I think, is the, the culture and spirit of the Australian people in that. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, a few few other ones I'll read out. Um, Ruby, Ruby, well done. You give me the first prize for backdrop. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for that. Well, I do have I do have a harbour here in, in Sydney. Uh, a little bit shorter one down in Melbourne, but anyway, uh, it, it, I have a note from um, uh, yes, uh, Charles uh, writes. I thought this was a very very uh, interesting comment from Charles Caves. Webinars are great while they're the only option to us, but they'll never take the place of face-to-face -face events. It's like the difference between watching a movie of, of the Grand Canyon and actually visiting the Grand Canyon. So I look forward to being able to mingle with other human beings in great numbers ASAP. Yeah, thanks, Charles. We look forward to seeing you when the time allows and uh, we can have the luxury of a glass of wine here. And many more uh, comments from great people. Um, the sound... There's a problem, problem with any sound reaching uh, Barara, apparently, I learned from the, uh, the member uh, up there, Julian Lisa. Uh, Chris Stone uh, sends in to say, uh, to give us a, a, an encouragement, and uh, so many others. Diane McInerney, uh, it'd be good to see you all afterwards and enjoy a glass of wine. And Gail, Gail, you're on there too. So thank you so much to everybody. Uh, look, I think this has been a terrific event from our point of view in terms of, uh, despite some of the technical issues, and I will just say, tell me actually that, that these things are listened into, but and algorithms pick up what we're saying and act accordingly. So I will just uh, give a shout out to Vodafone and ask if they might come and do something about my unstable internet here in, uh, in Sydney, but uh, uh, that's all I say. On that Vodafone, uh, sales uh, or sales and service, I hope you're listening. Look, that's enough of that. This is not really about us or me. It's about giving everybody a chance to join in and 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 build something. Well, I hope we can be uh, uh, we can be uh, clinically different, distant, if you like, but not socially distant. So, please, uh, I really, on this occasion, especially appreciate your comments on this event. There's so much that we we don't know about how these things are going to work. So it's trial and error. I mean, what time do you hold them? We felt that after giving it some thought that a lunchtime event was probably uh, the best, given that if we if we tried the old evening event, we'd be competing with, uh, with uh, you know, Andrew Bolt and, uh, and Peter Credlin. Uh, that's a hard ask. So maybe the daytime's a good time. Maybe we mix it up a bit. Please let me know uh, what's a good time. And uh, of course, it's so flexible, so we can come back. I know you had questions to ask. We can think about coming back if people want that and, and maybe cornering David for another hour in his study to ask some more questions of him, perhaps. Uh, we can link you all in and do it face to face. Look, the possibilities are endless. Uh, we really would like your suggestions about what would help you best uh, during this time. But in the meantime, we'll keep going in this, uh, I think, 
strangely rather exciting era we're in. Uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's great to have both the challenge but the ability through the modern technology to do this. So just one more plug for the book, David. It's a magnificent work and I think uh, we invest in this, uh, we, we partnered with you in this what, several years back. We committed to, to make sure these books came out. I'm great to see we're on volume three uh, already, but I think we see the importance of this now, right? I mean, liberalism is a, is a, is a as you, you often say, it's a continuing project and getting to understand uh, the essence of it is very, very uh, tricky. But I think by walking us through the history step by step, as we see today, I think it starts to really uh, be, be, uh, become very alive. So thank you, David. This is a, a great service you've done. Thank you, Scott, for joining us. All the Nick, best. Before you finally wind up, could I just thank you? Um, you your support for the book has been fantastic. <clears throat> and these books wouldn't have been published without the Menzies Research Centre's support. Um, so I, I think this is, uh, from my point of view, uh, something I'm enormously grateful for. Um, they're substantial works. Um, I'm pleased that Melbourne University Publishing agreed to take them on. I think they've done a terrific job with the publication. But ultimately, you need people who are prepared to support them and to support them financially and to help distribute them and, and um, uh, advertise them. And uh, this launch would not have occurred without the Menzies Research Centre. So, Nick, I thank you and, and I thank all who've been involved in the production of these books. Thank you. And, and Scott, but I also thank you. It's very good of oh, you. Thank no, thank you for having me along. It's fantastic to be able to, uh, a little activity in the last few days. This has been a fantastic activity to be able to spend my time on. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you.